Destroida. Hello, I'm crazy enough to come to Ukraine in the freezing cold winter all alone with almost no money, no film crew, no makeup for friends except for the one I made. Just myself visiting lots of beautiful cathedrals, wander the hall of spectacular palaces, learning about the history of its communist past, and revisiting the ground of Chernobyl disaster and its legacy, and going deep underground to the famous catacombs. Not to mention trying lots of traditional cuisines and cheap eats and getting around the local way. All done safely and expensively and easily. Anything I can do, you can do. DIY Destinations Ukraine and you are invited. We are so fortunate to live in a small world with so many cultures, so much beauty and so much diversity. The world waits for no one. And it's up to each of us to discover its magnificent destinations. I want to make travel accessible to all of us by showing how it can be done safely and inexpensively. Located in the heart of Europe, famous for its Black Sea coastlines, forested mountains, and the spectacular cathedrals, Ukraine is a key center of East Slavic culture and the home to a population of 43 million. Since declaring its independence, it has faced many civil unrest, resulting in the undeserving reputation of being unsafe. That's why I'm here, to show that Ukraine is safe. It's amazing to experience the best away has to offer, to see many of its spectacular architectures, to revisit its history, to experience its culture, and the warm hospitality of its proud citizens as well. To conquer and survive its cold winter and getting myself a Ukrainian wife. Landed. I'm ready to get through the immigrations. But that being said, let's hope it's gonna be a quick process. I'll start my wife hunting journey from its capital and the largest city, Kiev. I'll start my exploration from Brunswick International Airport. But before you can do anything, <laughs> we need Ukrainian money really bad. So welcome to Ukraine. Uh, ATM is always a headache because their fees at the airport is ridiculous. Uh, so I don't recommend you get money out because you can withdraw only like 120 each time and the fee are like $4. Alright, the rates here are pretty bad but like I say, you change just enough to get down until you find a fee-free ATM. With that being said, that's what I'm going to do. So after getting my Local currency, it's time to get down to Kiev. And uh, so first we're gonna go and get our ticket on board the sky bus. So I'm still waiting for the bus to run. And uh, it's really cool outside. <laughs> I wish I had got more clothing, but it's gonna be challenging filming this episode for sure. But I'm already here, so let's make the most out of it. So this person is actually collecting pairs right now. And I think uh, everyone has to pay him before he gets going. The most inexpensive way to get down to Kia City Center is riding a donkey. <laughs> I mean, uh, taking the Sky Bus or bus number 332. It costs only 100 Ukrainian harvinias or the $4. It takes about an hour ride to the south side of Central Railway Station. So after you get off the bus, you have to come right inside here at Central Railway Station. And to get to the metro, it goes straight, straight, and straight, and straight until you see it. Kiev Central Railway Stations also service cities in Serbia, Hungary, Moldova, Romania, and other cities across Eastern Europe and within Ukraine. Wow, this is one beautiful train station. I mean, just look at this. The old railway station was constructed during 1868 to 1870 with a two-floor brick station building in the old English Gothic styles and was designed by the architect Andy Venezhevsky. The current central station building was constructed in 1927 to 1932. It was built in the style of Ukrainian Baroque with some element of constructionism and today is designated as the landmark of architecture. 
The metro runs between 6 a.m. to midnight daily. The cost of a single ride is cheap, costing only 25 cents for all forms of public transportation. Or you can get a prepaid smart card, costing only $2, with a built-in volume discount. Oh yeah. All right, so I think I found my train. Oh, it's 2.17 and it's going to my dance square. With that being said, I hope I'm right this time and I will need to go back and forth. Fingers crossed. Alright, I have to say, their metro are really, really, really deep. I think it takes like more than a minute and a half, two minutes to go from the bottom all the way up. After getting off the Maidan Square, there's ATMs everywhere. Remember this, do not accept their predetermined or dynamic exchange rate. The markup is pretty insane. So just go with the float. Maidan translates into open or open square. It's Kiev's main square and one of the oldest. The square received is currently in 1991, in the aftermath of the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine. And since the square has been a traditional place for political rallies, some of the biggest political protests in the country have taken place here, including Ukraine Without Kushma campaign and the Orange Revolution. I'd like to thank my sponsor hostel, TIU Kinesthetics, located right across from my dance square for providing me with accommodation for the filming of Kiev. They offer both private rooms and dorm beds, fast Wi-Fi, TV rooms, fully equipped kitchen, and clean bathrooms with a hot shower. Most importantly, friendly and helpful staff. Thanks guys! Next morning, my mail order bride have arrived. <laughs> Just in time for breakfast. Uh, maybe not quite. Hello everybody, my name is Elena from Awesome Kiev. Awesome Kiev is my blog about this city and also all kind of walking tours that I offer to my guests. So today I'm going to introduce you to Awesome Kiev, as awesome as you are. So I'm really excited to try this lovely Ukrainian dish, Sydney kit. Ukrainian put uh, sour cream in everything. So, so I think this is how I eat it. Oh my god, it's like pancake, but it's like creamy pancake. It's so awesome. And she said that these are not hard to make. It's fairly easy. I'm going to have to learn this and bring it home. After filling up, our first stop is back to school to see the worldwide famous symbol of Tara Shevchenko National University of Kiev. So right now we are near the red building. Red building is main building of Taras Shevchenko University. Founded in 1834, back in time it was uh, the university named after Saint Volodymyr because of the Volodymyr the Great, the prince who baptized Kiev Rus and brought Christianity to here. It is in the red colors because the red color was the main color on the flag of Prince Volodymyr the Great. After receiving my PhD degree, we celebrated in a cold nearby, in this famous boulevard. We are now at Taras Shevchenko Boulevard that in 19th century used to be the main road that was leading from other parts of the country to the city. And Russian Emperor Nikolai I was using this road very often. So the local governor Bibikov decided to impress the emperor somehow. So they brought the chestnuts from the Balkans and they put it all over the boulevard but when he came to here he said it looks too cozy and too unofficial so all the trees were just digged out and there were the pollens that were planted here but after 100 years after this event people really started to grow the chestnuts everywhere 
And that's how chestnut became the symbol of Kyiv. Ukraine is known for its countless Orthodox churches, a perfect place to confess and redeem your sins, uh, whatever that is. So let's go to church serving. Um, first stop, uh, St. Volodymyr Cathedral? Oh, I think that's right. St. Volodymyr Cathedral was built on donation of people who were living here, both poor and rich people. Simple workers and businessmen were donating money to build this beautiful cathedral. Also, Russian painter Viktor Vasnetsov spent 10 years instead of plant three to paint everything inside this beautiful cathedral. And one of his contemporaries was coming to here and saying that I can see all the colors, the colors of cathedral and the paintings, but I could never see the colors of the dress that was wearing the painter because he used to paint a lot and all of his outfit was always in the beautiful colors of this cathedral. On the way to the next attraction, we'll pass by the impressive stone structure. Opened in 1901, the National Opera House of Ukraine is home to Kiev Opera. It's founded in 1867 and the third oldest in Ukraine. Remember, I'm here to find my male order bride. I think I need more luck. And Alina offered to show me how Ukrainian people does it. So let's find a pair of old shoes. <laughs> I am not kidding. So here are how Ukrainian people are making the wishes. So now I'm gonna make the wish, but I will not tell you what I'm wishing for. So we say if you put here three of your right hands, your wish is gonna come true. But as long as you don't have the three hands, you have to come with your friends here. By the way, if you want to try this, just come to the Golden Gate of Kiev. Constructed between 1017 to 1024, it served as a selling gate. It was one of three main entrances to the wall city fortification of the old Kiev. The structure was completely dismantled in the Middle Ages, leaving few vestiges of its existence. It was rebuilt completely by the Soviet authorities in 1982 for the 1500th anniversary of Kiev, even though no images of the original gates have survived. Today, the structure houses a museum where visitors can learn about the history of the construction of the Golden Gate, as well as the ancient Kiev. Kiev is considered one of the Eastern Europeans' cultural hotspot, an amazing hub for street art and a magnet for murals. Since 2014, a number of large murals begin to appear on the facade of old Soviet buildings. These bold, massive paintings can be found mostly in the neighborhood east and west of Dimmer. Today, Ukrainian's capital city holds over 150 pieces of public art produced by local and international artists, often hidden in the lesser known part of the city, and are reshaping its identity. Kiev's first UNESCO World Heritage Site was inscribed in 1990. This honor goes to St. Sophia's Cathedral, one of the city's best-known landmarks. The cathedral's name comes from the 6th century Hakka Sophia Cathedral in Constantinople, with the first foundation laid in 1037 or 1011. But the cathedral took two decades to complete. Originally, the cathedral was a burial place of two Kivian rulers and the cathedral's founder Yaroslav I the Wise. 
although only the latter grave survived to this day. After the Russian Revolution of 1917 and during the Soviet anti-religious campaign of the 1920s, the government plan called for the cathedral's destruction and transformation of the ground into a park. But luckily, it never happened. But nonetheless, in 1934, Soviet authorities confiscate the structure from the church and designate it as an architectural and historical museum. Today, the complex is now remains a secular museum of Ukrainian Christianity, with most of its visitors being tourists. Just 5 minutes away, located on the right bank of Deeper River on the edge of a bluff, to the northeast of St. Sophia Cathedral, that St. Michael's Gold Dome Monastery was not so lucky. Originally built in the Middle Ages between 1108 to 1113, the original cathedral was demolished by the Soviet authorities in the 1930s, but was reconstructed and opened in 1999, following the Ukrainian independence in 1991. St. Michael's Monastery, built in 11th century, was totally destroyed in 1934 by the Soviet government who wanted to build here the biggest international square in Soviet Union. So they put the bombs inside and put everything into the air. Everything was rebuilt just in 1990s. Also the monastery was really supporting to people who took part in the Ukrainian revolution. It was used as a shelter for the protesters. And also in December 2013, the bell tower started unstoppably ringing the bells to warn people about the police coming from government to beat the protesters. They have not done it for 800 years since the Mongol Tatar invasion. During the Mongol invasion in 1240, the monastery is believed to be seriously damaged and the gold-plated dome was removed. The cloister was subsequently fell into disrepair and there is no documentation of it for the following two and a half centuries. By 1496, the monastery had been revived and its name was changed from St. Mitrius Monastery to St. Michael's after the cathedral church was built by Svavapos II. After numerous restorations and enlargement during the 16th century, it gradually became one of the most popular and the wealthiest monastery in Ukraine. Before the Russian Revolution of 1917, rings are manufactured and blessed at St. Michael's Monastery, known as St. Barbara's Ring, very popular among the citizens of Kiev. They usually serve as good luck charms and, according to public belief, occasionally protect against the witchcraft. Maybe I should find uh, one for better luck in finding my uh, Ukrainian mail or the bribes. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> before you get the uh, church fatigue, uh, let's check out one more. I promise. I still got some confessions to make. This one is also really pretty. St. Andrew Church is the only church in Kyiv without the bells. Kyiv people made the story about that, that when the bells start ringing, the water will go up and there will be flooding everywhere. But in fact, Italian architect Rastrelli just did not put it in the plan. Oh yeah, here is where you can also make a wish come true as well. Is not a secret what I will be wishing for. So here is the nose in the wall, which is actually the real nose of one of Ukrainian writers, Nikola Hohul, who even wrote the novel about the guy who is waking up in the morning and finds out he doesn't have a nose anymore. Here you can make a wish like I'm doing right now. The story behind is about this guy who was trying to marry two girls at the same time. This one for the money of her parents and the other one for her kindness and beauty. People come here to make a wish about their family happiness, about their happy marriages. 
and about financial perspectives. <laughs> After all that praying, it's time to settle down with the love of my life. Uh, I mean, with my sweet, sweet pie to refill. The Perovsky is a traditional Ukrainian puff pastry which consists of individual sized baked or fried bun, stuffed with a variety of fillings. Mm -mm. This is very popular for typical Ukrainian baked pies. They are really sweet and very delicious, so we're going to try them now. Now, let's take a metro to our next attraction. I promise it's not going to be another church. is a park of internal glory at the end of the Alley of Heroes, which led from Larva Street to a memorial built in 1957 to commemorate the 30th anniversary of victory over Nazi and the soldiers of World War II. The obliques at the pedestal measures 26 meters high with a grave of unknown soldier at its base. Okay, <laughs> remember I say we will not visit another church? Well, I lie, uh, somewhat. So let's redeem my sins by visiting the Kiev Monastery of Caves. It's only 5 minutes away. It's not that bad. Uh, technically, this historic Orthodox Christian monastery is a part of St. Sophia Cathedral. It means it's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. While being a cultural attraction, the monastery is also active and affiliated with the Moscow Patriarchate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, with over 100 monks in its residence. The Great Larva Bell Tower is one of the most noble features of the Kiev skyline and among the main attractions of Larva. With 96.5 meters in height, it is the highest freestanding tower at the time of its construction in 1731 to 1745. The main Dormition church of the monastery was built in the 11th century, but was destroyed during the World War II a couple of months after the Nazi Germany troops occupied the city of Kiev. It wasn't until 2000 when it was fully restored. Located on the same ground, north of the Monastery of Caves is the Church of Savier. It's a former suburban resident of Vladimir the Great and his lucky descendants. It was also the site of a monastery. The construction of the present structure is not documented, but most art historians dates to 1113 to 1125. One of the historical significance includes at least three monomachies were buried underneath the baptistry. George I of Kiev, the founder of Moscow, his son Glab, and his daughter Euphenia. Initially, a team of Greek masters painted the interior with frescoes during the construction of a new church between 1640 to 1642, and it was renovated in 1751 to 1752, and again in 1813 to 1814. Just 10 minutes walkway is the National Museum of History of Ukraine in the Second World War. It is a memorial complex commemorating the German-Soviet War. The museum was moved twice before ending up in the current location where it is ceremoniously opened on Victory Day on May 9, 1981. The museum is one of the largest in Ukraine and the exhibit includes armor vehicles, gun and jet units, naval weapons, armor personnel carriers, and military aircrafts. The museum also shares a site with this scary motherland statue, which has become one of the most recognized landmarks of Kiev. It also opened on the same date, May 9th, 1981. The stainless steel statue stands 62 meters tall and weighs just a little bit more than me at 560 tons. The sword is located on the statue's right hand, with the left hand holding up a shield with a state emblem of the Soviet Union. 
In April 2015, the Parliament of Ukraine outlawed Soviet and communist symbols, street names, and monuments in a decommunalization attempt. <laughs> However, in Ukraine, when it comes to government getting anything done, uh, it can be uh, pretty slow. Uh, really, really slow. In the February of 2018, the government stated that state emblem of Soviet Union on the shield of the monument should be removed in accordance to the decommunalization law. But as you can see, <laughs> it still hasn't been removed. Uh, maybe never. <laughs> Last but not least for the day, we'll visit the Kiev Fortress where you can make your first move on kissing a bride. Uh, I mean, uh, where you can catch up on free concerts or just enjoy a romantic sunset over the city. Mm. Not many people, even in Kiev, know about this place, which is located in Kiev Fortress and also for people who know, they are coming here to overhear the concerts that are happening at Olympijski Stadium, which is just in front of us. Getting more and more Ukrainian. Uh, I might come home with a Ukrainian wife if my Ukrainians improve. Wow! Wish me luck. After this long day, I think it's time for that romantic dinner. Alina told me the best way to warm up a Ukrainian woman's heart is with a bowl of traditional hot soup. So right now we're gonna start eating Ukrainian borscht. It's very important to put smetana, sour cream inside and also to eat this with salo, which is the fat of the pork, and with the pampushka, which is the garlic bread. Oh my god, this is epic. All right, so this is my dinner tonight. It's the main courses look fabulous. Okay. And this is something called Chicken Kiev. What it is, is a stuffed chicken breast filled with butter mm -mm -mm. and something else, which you'll find out. And by the way, but on the bottom, my favorite mashed potatoes. But let's unravel this mess. Oh my god, look at that. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is probably the most juiciest chicken I will ever eat. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. I'm not losing weight tonight. That's the only bad news. Other than that, this is epic. Also, sweeten up my date with some serious dose of sugar. So right now we're gonna try smetanik. This is Ukrainian dessert, means the one that is made with the sour cream. All right, I'm not ending my dinner without some sweets. This is actually Kiev cake. It's surrounded with tasty crumbles. This cake is made by a bunch of fellow worker comrades inside the Karlsmark factory by mistake. But it tastes so good, everyone loves it. And here it goes, it's become popular, and I'm going to eat it and have some communists in me. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. Not to forget a farewell drink with a Ukrainian tuxedo to end the night in style. So, so before you leave, um, they always give you like kind of like goodbye drinks. It's a Nice farewell stand up. So, uh, a drink, and also a little dessert. That's really strong. Yeah, it's very nice. Thank you. So, this is the bus that's taking us to Chernobyl. The ride takes about an hour and a half. Um, I'm actually really excited. Um, so, let's get some rest before. <laughs> The action began because it is a whole day. 64 k and it's to go. Next morning, I'm also going to one of the most fascinating place on Earth. Sally is also the site of the one of the two worst nuclear disasters in the history. The Chernobyl disaster was a nuclear accident that occurred on 26 of April 1986 at the nuclear number 4 reactor at Chernobyl nuclear power plant. 
You can only visit the Chernobyl nuclear disaster sites with a guided tour, costing about $100 to $150. So bargain and bargain hard. I'd like to thank my tour sponsor Chernobyl Exclusive Tour for providing me with a complimentary seat on their daily tours. Thanks guys. So we just arrived at the checkpoint and I'm not too sure what's going on but driving is speak English and it's really cold and we're waiting inside the car van. Next, your guy will read out your last rights. <laughs> I am not kidding. Also, bring your passport. Uh, they will check to see in case you're on the terrorist list or unknowingly work part-time for Osama Bin Laden. With that being done, uh, welcome to us, Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. So this is a town near Chernobyl, it's called Salitza. And what it means is behind the forest, but as you can see, right now is in the forest. We are going to see a bank and a post office that's abandoned. As a result of rising ambient radiation level off-site, a 10 km radius exclusion zone was created 36 hours after the accident. About 49,000 people were evacuated from the area, primarily from Priet. The exclusion zone was later increased to 30 km radius, when a further 68,000 people were evacuated from the wider area. Zazia is one of the distant villages within the zone that was affected and totally abandoned. Oh, this used to be a food store and if you can come in, be very very careful because the condition of the uh, structure, it's not in a great shape. And also these scattered um, things in the ground, so just be very careful. This was the first village within the exclusion zone to be totally abandoned in May 1986. However, the 3200 inhabitants were slow to depart as they were initially unaware of the unfolding disaster just 25 kilometers away. This vibrant and thriving village has a supermarket, palace of culture, as well as a school and a hospital. After the disaster, the palace of culture became a barrack for soldiers to send in to do the cleanup on the nuclear reactor and the nearby city of Priyat. This is a cultural club and uh, where cinema, dancing and all the social events are taking place. So this is one of the abandoned homes I'm in right now and uh, the, it's crazy, it's <laughs> sort of eerie actually. So right now we're entering the Chernobyl town, as you can see that's the sign of the Chernobyl. And Chernobyl is actually one of the oldest cities in Ukraine. Uh, faith fighters, policemen, all these people working here, actually live in this town and uh, were working in this. Not far away is the site of the monument to those who have saved the world. This memorial is dedicated to the firefighters that have died pulling up the fire after the initial blast and also to the Chernobyl liquidator that have cleaned up after the accident. So behind me is actually uh, some of the equipment that was used in the recovery effort in the Chernobyl disaster. They are actually not scale models, they are actual equipment. And the radiation here is actually slightly higher but still a safe level according to Ukrainian standards. 0 0.2. And if in a 30 km zone in the soil we have such usual technogenic radiant glides like cesium 137 and strontium 90. Next, we approach 7 km to the site of the nuclear reactor to the village of Kapachi. Within this area, a bulldozer would dig a large trench in front of each house before burying the building and covering it with earth and flattening the soil. The counter around me are going off non-stop because as we approach closer to the um, power plant, 
the radiation level is peaking at exponential rate, but it's still um, it's safe to remain here for uh, like few minutes, but we have to get going pretty soon. You see, few centimeters. This is actually a Batman kindergarten. And all around it, it's actually, you can see people's report cards, children's books, toys, and uh, cradles, and so on. And it's actually really freaky. It's almost like they just left overnight, and yeah. This kindergarten and one other brick building are the only architectural structures that remain standing. The government did not recognize the fact that these highly contaminated buildings and houses will steep radioactive isotopes into the water table. Burying the building drove the radiotoxin deeper into the environment. As a result, the soil and the water surrounding the former village remains contaminated with radioactive material for thousands of years to come. Finally, we reached the heart of the nuclear power plant. This accident started during a safety test on a nuclear reactor. As a result, it caused an open-air reactor core fire that released considerable amount of airborne radioactive contaminant for about 9 days and precipitated to other parts of Soviet Union and the Western Europe before being finally contained. In 2016, a giant dome known as a new safety confinement was slid over the sarcophagus, encasing the nuclear reactor number 4. The most contaminated part of the complex, which is the red force, and uh, the reason for that is you can get one year of radiation in just one hour. Next, we headed 15 km north of Chernobyl to the ghost city of Priet, the most eerie part of the tour. Named after the nearby Priet River, the city was founded on February 4, 1970 as the ninth nuclear city in the Soviet Union to serve the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The government officially proclaimed the city in 1979 and had grown to a population of 50,000 by the time it was evacuated on the afternoon of April 27, 1986. I'm surrounded with like roads and roads of apartment buildings and it's just abandoned. It's as close as you can call a ghost town. There's absolutely nobody, nobody lives here. Being here is like walking back in time and getting a true feel of life under the era of communism, including many of the propagandas and things that people once used during that period. And cell phone is definitely not included. Once again, there is no cell phone service here. So don't get lost and follow your guide. And um, just remember, Tinder does not work here. Uh, not a great place to find a male older bride. Decoration room behind the theater. As you can see, after 30 some years, it still looks pretty new, actually. A bit freaky. Let's go into the theater. <laughs> Crazy.
The last place we visit in this ghost town is a abandoned school, completely in disrepair. It's pretty sad. This is a pretty interesting experience being here. It's uh, like, ugh, this is as close as I get to uh, a ghost town. Walking towards a uh, old Soviet radar site that detects uh, intercontinental ballistic missile launch from U.S. during the Cold War. Finally, we ended the tour with a visit to one of the top secret military installations during the Soviet era. The Dhaka military radar station was one of the two operational over-the-horizon radar systems used as part of Soviet missile defense early warning radar network. The system operated from July 1976 to December 1989. This system was extremely powerful with over 10 megawatts in some cases and broadcast in shortwave radio bands. In 1976, the new and powerful radio signal was detected simultaneously worldwide and quickly dubbed the Woodpecker by the amateur radio operators. Before leaving the Chernobyl exclusion zone, you are subject to a radiation exam. Uh, they want to make sure you don't walk away with any radiated um, souvenirs. With that being done, I'm not going anywhere without warming up first. Uh, how about a dining experience in the radiated zone? I am not joking. So not included in the price of the tour is uh, lunch and if you wanted to pay for 10 uh, US dollars you get some cold cut to a cheese uh, salad some bread and drinks with well, that being said bon appetit so this is actually coleslaw uh, with meat mm. with um, sour cream Ukrainian fried rice. Look at that. Mm. After getting back to Kiev, I quickly pack up and headed to a central railway station and prepare for my uh, wife hunting journey um, to be continued in lab. There's a scam going on in the train station here. Uh, there's ordinary uh, looking passengers who offer you help and uh, basically take you to your cabin and once you arrive you demand a really large tip uh, so don't fall for it uh, with that being said it's my trains leaving right now have a safe and enjoyable ride so let me show you what they provide on the train for you fresh linens which is really nice uh, a pillow and as well as over there, these uh, these are very very heavy uh, blanket. So I just woke up. And it's that's so surprising comfortable. And uh, we're gonna be arriving in 20 minutes. Uh. You can get down to the city center with a tram. I recommend you get a left city car, which allows you to get unlimited trams and trolley buses, as well as access to most museums at no cost. We are right on the main square of Lviv, 
I have to thank a Lev Art Hustle for providing me with an extremely comfortable stay for the filming of Lev. They offer both dorm beds and private rooms, full kitchens and free tea and coffee, and clean hot showers. The best of all, it's located right in the center of Lev's old town. Thanks guys! Lev is located only 70 km from the Polish border. It is the largest city in the historic capital of Western Ukraine with a population of a quarter million. Named in the honor of Leo, the eldest son of Daniel, the king of Ruthenia, it was the capital of the kingdom of Ruthenia from 1272 to 1349. Later, it was conquered by King Casimir III the Great, who then became known as the King of Poland and Ruthenia. Today, the traits of its Polish and Austro-Hungarian heritage are still evident in its architectures, which blend Central and Eastern European styles with those of Italy and Germany. Its historic city center is on the UNESCO World Heritage List. So, finish your fries and let's get started. But thank goodness, <laughs> the left opera house is located right across from the McDonald's. And there's a rumor it's full of beautiful opera singers uh, and cute ballerinas. A uh, perfect place for uh, wife hunting. Now left has always been a historical cultural center of Ukraine. And by no coincidence, this beautiful opera house was commissioned and completed in 1900s. And it's located right here in the historical old city and it plays homes to its theater, opera, and ballet. In 1895, the city announced an architectural design competition which attracted a large number of submissions. An independent jury chose a design by Alman Grolowski, a graduate of Berlin Building Academy and the director of City's Engineering Academy. Instead of using a traditional foundation, the designer utilized a reinforced concrete base for the first time in Europe. Originally built on the former marshland of the submerged Parvina River, the Lev Opera now sits on the tree-lined centerpiece of Lev's historic old city. At the end of the 19th century, the local leaders felt there's a need for a large city theater to be situated at the capital of Galicia. The Lev Theater of Opera and Ballet is built in the classical tradition using the forms and details of Renaissance and Baroque architectures, also known as Viennese Neo-Renaissance style. In June 1897, the cornerstone was placed. Gorowski oversaw the construction, earthwork, and designs, employing the leading stone masons from the city and beyond. Local materials were used wherever possible. However, marble elements were manufactured in Vienna. A special linen for paint in the foyer was imported from Belgium. Construction continued for three years. Funding came from the city and the surrounding communities, and voluntary donations. The cost of the work exceeded 6 million Austrian crowns. The Lev Opera opened on October 4, 1900s. The cultural elite, painters, writers, and composers, as well as delegations from various European theaters, attended the opening festivities. The stucco moldings and paintings on the wall and ceiling of the multi tier auditorium and foyer gives a richly festival appearance. The building is crowned by large bronze statues symbolizing glory, poetry, and music. Oh, <laughs> As for pickup opera singers and ballerinas, um, most likely they will be practicing. Not a great idea, but. So, one of the great things about this opera house is you can come in and see the rehearsals for free. It's really, really awesome and beautiful here.
On the way to the next attraction, you'll pass by the University of Lev, the oldest higher institution of learning in Ukraine dating from 1661, when the Polish king John II of Kashmir granted the first loyal charter. Today, the university is home to 12,000 students with 111 specialty programs, including theology, law, medicine, humanity, and mathematics, and of course, biology. But if you don't need another degree, a short walk away is the location of St. George Cathedral, built in a Baroque style, constructed between 1744 to 1760. This is the third manifestation of a church inhabited the site since the 13th century. And this is why I'm going to pray for good luck in picking up a male order bride. The St. George Cathedral was built between 1744 to 1760 on this hill overlooking the city. Now this is the third church built on the site because since the 13th century it has been targets for invaders and vandals and during the 19th and 20th century it has become a mother church the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church A church has stood on the St. George Hill since around 1280. The original wooden church and the fortress where it was situated in was destroyed by the King Kashmir III of Poland in 1340. A fourth column Byzantine basilica was constructed for the local Eastern Orthodox Church. In July 1700s, the Act of Unification of Lev, Archipachi with Holy See was proclaimed. The construction of the present cathedral started in 1746 and finished in 1762 and its design reflects both Western influences and the traditional Ukrainian church construction. The St. George Cathedral is home to one of the most treasured relics, including the icon of the Virgin Mary. The interior was decorated with a luxurious embellishment created by the local artistic talent of Lev, including princes, the sculpture of the cathedral, and created a spectacular St. George statue. In the cathedral's tomb are buried a many distinguished figures of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Among them are multiple cardinals and metropolitans. Now, if you really want to come to Ukraine, you know, winter time, there's always like these little houses, uh, what's called little bakeries around along the way, where you can come in, just like chill out like most people, and uh, they have coffee right there. Where they, you can get coffee. <laughs> Ukrainas. And that equals oh, to be like <laughs> 20 cents. No, 15 cents for a cup of coffee. Another major church in Lev is the Church of St. Oha and Elizabeth, located between the city's main rail station and the Old Town. Originally built as a Roman Catholic Church of St. Elizabeth by the Latin Archbishop of Lev St. Joseph Boratsky in between 1903 to 1911 as a parish church for the city's dynamic developing western suburbs. In 1939, the church was damaged in a bombing raid, but remained open until 1946. After the war, the building was used as a warehouse and fell further into ruins until it was returned to a faithful with the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1991, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church was established and the church was reconsecrated as a Greek Catholic Church of St. Oha and Elizabeth. Closer to Old Town is the home to Armenian Cathedral of Assumption Mary. This small Armenian church was built in the year 1363 to 1370, founded by the Armenian merchant from Kaffa, and it was established as the mother church of Epiki. It is said to have been modeled after the Cathedral of Annie in the ancient Armenian capital. 
1437, the cathedral was also surrounded with an arcade gallery. Today, only a southern one is preserved, and the northern one has been rebuilt into secrecy. After the church is damaged in a city fire in 1527, a new stone belfry was erected in 1571. In the 1630s, the main nave was extended and was further rebuilt in 1723. From the 17th century until the 1945, the cathedral belonged to Armenian Catholic Diocese Alev, with a union with the Catholic Church. The present-day interior is largely the work of Han Henry de Rosen and Joseph M. Mathor. The cathedral holds two wonder-working icons, St. Gregory the Illustrator and the Mother of God, brought in during the 17th century from Yeslav. So for those of you who already know, I drank so much coffee today. I need to go to the bathroom again. And of course, I'm not just going to go into any store and just like use it and not buy anything. So instead of getting another coffee, I'm actually getting a, a dessert right there. And it looks so darn good. That is so much. It looks so good. And it's about 30 kronas. So it's only about a dollar something. <laughs> I think I like about it is actually it's made of real fruit. It's such a cheesecake and with a really nice cluster. One complaint. It's a bit small. It looks bigger than the um, I can probably finish this in about four bites. All right, that's the entrance right. But I'm hungry and I heard there's a legendary dungeon in the old town uh, where I can dine with the dragons. Uh, I'm ready for that adventure. This is pretty strange actually. I never encounter any restaurants like that. There's no sign downstairs so if you don't know it, you actually can get lost. Hey, by the way, be careful your head because... Um, oh my god, this gets even more stranger right now. Oh my god, look at this. Strange decorations. Alright. So that's a bathroom. And... I don't know what the heck this is. Okay, so let's just continue right here. I have no clue what that is, but it, I think it's a planet. It's definitely strange. Let's go on to the next, next floor, next room. So there's a light thingy here. Life rack, I think. And I don't know what this is. Sound look like some some oxygen mass. But everything's in Ukrainian. And uh, the staff, they don't smile. So they're not being friendly. I want to ask someone, do you speak English? They say no. But we're still going to continue and check out the rest. That's some sort of surveillance camera and uh, The floor is actually really small here, so only one person can go at a time. And I'm not too sure what this is. <laughs> what this is, but germs in your hand, magnify it, and to get rid of it. I think that's my interpretation. I don't know. What do you think? This, I don't know what the heck this is. Just look at the. Um, I don't know. I know it's probably not cocaine or anything. It's just really, really awkward. Sounds like brick inside that glass. This is really strange, awkward. So this is another room right here. Uh, it's uh, very strange, it's full of books. <laughs> Even though it's really cool down here, I'm gonna go up and take a look. Uh, so we're gonna make a quick trip and then we're gonna, I'm gonna have my dinner. Crazy. Oh, oh. Oh. 
What the heck? My God. I don't know. How the heck they got a car all the way up here, which is really, really strange. I'm gonna eat here. Honestly, I'm gonna eat here. Now, this strange restaurant also have strange food. This is uh, chicken salad, but this is almost like a bread. And then beneath it, voila. So, and they serve it in this like really strange like looking cup. Like. So there's apparently a fire show in six minutes, so I'm going to go down and check things out. It's uh, I think I've been released from my prison now. They should come in any minute, now it's 9.24 and I hope they come soon because it's so cold out here in like Uh This kind of sucks, I was changing my battery because down to like 40 something percent and just while I changed the battery, <laughs> the firecracker went off. So uh, I kind of missed it but I did give you a little smoke in the end. But that being said, I want to get my meal back in my prison. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the best jail I've ever been in. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great jail. I'll, I'll stay here forever. This is actually pork intestine. So, it actually tastes pretty good. Uh, now, I'm not strange to these things because I grew up eating them when I was younger. Next is chicken stew. So, Mmm, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't mind staying in this prison as long as they feed me good food and beer and this is actually pretty good beer <laughs> mm. cheers guys After a night in prison, I'm sure we can all agree I did my time and must be released. For now, I'm going to determine to aim high from now on by paying a visit to Lev High Castle. As a bonus, you can only get there on foot. A great exercise. You start to get a nice view of the city, which is really nice. I think it's going to be totally worth it. And the bonus? Sun's out. Oh. Oh gosh, I wish someone could just carry me up. Okay, with well, that being said, let's continue. I finally reached the top. Well, almost. Yeah, you do get a really nice view. Look at that. Voila! Welcome to High Castle, people. The historic High Castle is approximate to the city center of Lev and located on top of the Castle Hill and currently the highest point in the city, 430 meters above the sea level. Formerly being surrounded by fortification wall and served as a main defense fort of the city during its existence. In 1704, when Lev was occupied by the Swedes, the castle was heavily damaged. In 1777, Austria initiated a disassembling of the fortification around the castle. In the 19th century, then the destroyed castle was taken apart and new items were built in its place. The fortification was strengthened, trees were planted on the hill slope, and this present-day park was constructed. Be careful coming down because I almost slipped. As you can see, snow is um, slippery so just be careful watch your steps that's what i say
Once again, it's really cold here in the winter to walk around. So today, I'm going to hang out around the old town. But first, <laughs> a fresh dose of morning joe at the coffee mine. Lev is considered the coffee capital of Ukraine, with the first coffee house dating back to the 17th century. Not only you can enjoy a coffee drink here, but you can also see and smell many unusual way of coffee extraction and traditional tool used for grinding and roasting the fresh coffee bean. Next door is also home to Museum of Ethnography. Your left car also get you in free. This museum is one of the largest and the oldest of its type not only in Ukraine but also in Central Eastern Europe. It presents a unique and remarkable collection of traditional objects of national culture and folk arts and many masterpieces of Ukrainian arts. It also contains unique samples of wool arts and crafts. The original collection can be divided into two large departments, ethnographical and that of art crafts. This is where you can see the cultural, spiritual, and everyday objects of Ukrainian life, household tools, and instruments. Additionally, there are samples of decorative and applied arts from different people of the world, which constitute the rich collection of 90,000 exhibits. Next door is also home to Lev Historical Museum, one of the oldest and the richest museums in Ukraine, established in 1893. To be honest, I did not expect to find this. Um, so many inventions from Leonardo da Vinci. I have no clue what the purpose of most of these tools are. I can only guess. It includes various inventions by the great inventor. Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, I have to say the first uh, that is my favorite is this one right here. The first ever automatic machine guns. How impressive is that? Around the corner, there's a little secret place where you get hooked up for drugs. Seriously. A pharmacy that date back to 1735 with the nickname Under the Black Eagle. But since 1966, it has been offering more than just medicine. There's also a hidden museum. It's about this museum is you don't even know it exists. It's actually an entrance located behind the counter of a working pharmacy. So uh, I came in and I thought, that's really weird. It's a working pharmacy, but here I am. And I'm finally inside here after paying them 25, 20 for the missions, five for the camera. <laughs> after paying a small entrance fee to a pharmacist, the pharmacy opened a wooden shelf room fully stocked with antique pharmacy equipment. There are mortars, pestles, various beakers, ornate scales, jar containing tinctures, and other medicines, all from the 19th and the 20th century. Now this room has all kind of machineries and tools and uh, also raw ingredients that they use to make medicines. There's also an exhibit introduced different stages of plant input processing and the medicine production from it. The laboratory room also has a herbarium of rare medicinal plants from all over the world. Museum visitors can walk through 16 rooms to different historic era of medicine care, going back in time as they retreat further into the building.
So right now I'm going underground actually towards like a little dungeon. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, look at this. And the basement dungeon is where the early 18th century interiors are recreated. The visitors can see some of the earliest form of pharmaceutical studies, an alchemist laboratory. Some of the stuff is <laughs> pretty creepy. Ugh. So this underground <laughs> dungeon museum, it's pretty big and there's more on this side. In a replica brewery, the pharmacists still offer iron wine, an ancient iron boost beverage said to raise a hemoglobin in the blood. On the way to a town hall, I passed by the market square, home to 44 tenement houses, which represent civil architectural styles from Renaissance to modernism. There are four fountains that can be found in each of the four corners. Each was sculpture that represent four Greek mythological figures, including Diana, the Roman goddess of hunt, the moon, and the nature associated with the wild animal in the woodlands. Neptune, which presides over the realm of heaven, the earthy world, and the underworld world. Amphitrides, the sea goddess and the wife of Poseidon, and the queen of the sea. Lastly, Adontis sits in front of the town hall, Ugh, which I forget to get. Damn it! But life goes on, so let's get high. <laughs> no joke. Uh, we are going to climb up the town hall's bell tower. Once again, your lab car works here too. And as a bonus, a great exercise and a free drinking water. Sweet. Lab has a series of town hall buildings since approximately 1357. They have been for centuries being recognized landmark of the community, what first appeared shortly after the city government established in 1357. Sadly, the building was made of wood, and soon it burned down in 1381. There's quite a lot of walking up the stairs to the top of the bell tower, but I think the view will be worth it. I think so. <laughs> you can hear that noise, but that's the clock, which is controlled by the mechanism inside here. And uh, it's pretty interesting. This is really, really, really old, I can tell you. After the fire, the construction of Stone Town Hall was started. By the end of the Middle Ages, Left City Hall was a conglomeration of buildings. The middle part of the building was its oldest part, dating from the 14th century. The western part was built in the year 1491 to 1504. The dominant feature of the composition was the tallest tower, but was later toppled by many a shackle. I think just one more step, see. A new tower was rebuilt between 1830 to 1835 following the Viennese classical style. In 1848, during the revolutionary event in Lev city center, the original clock tower collapsed. In 1851, the building was repaired, and since 1939, the building has been housing the Lev city council. Let me give you a view of the city from here. 
You can basically uh, see all the major monuments from here. All the landmarks in this city. And once again, right on this side. Look at that. <laughs> well, it costs 30 to get up here, but uh, it's not bad. It's like, work out to be like a dollar or something. Um, it is cold though, so with that being said, I'm gonna head down. We're gonna head to our next destination. It's really, really narrow. We just hope at the same time no one else is coming up because it's not possible for two people to go up at the same time or go down. <laughs> if the town hall is not historical and old enough, a short walk away is a museum of arsenals, the oldest of the three historical arsenal buildings in Lev. The building in its present shape were erected in 1554 to 1556, above the 14th century structure of unknown function. It was formally attached to a city wall and featured a torture chamber. The arsenal building was blown up by the Swedes during the Great Northern War, but was subsequently restored. Well, this museum has all types of weapons from the various eras uh, from all over the globe, not just from Europe. In fact, the one behind me right here is actually from Japan. So I'm just going to take a look. Open on May 18, 1981 at the former city arsenal, the exhibition represents an example of ancient weapons from more than 30 countries. The exhibition is based on chronicle and thematic principle according to the type and place of weapon manufacturing. The chronicle limits of the item exposed cover 11th to 20th centuries and give an idea of a weapon evolution, weapon types, kinds, production centers, and aesthetic taste of gunsmith masters, level of technological development of the society, and so on. All the main type of weapons are showcased in the museum. Code, fire, article of defensive weapons, including knives, daggers, swords, sabers, and more. The museum is most notable for exhibition containing all type of medieval swords, such as belt swords, half-handed swords, two-handed swords, as well a collection of handguns. There's also a rifle and pistols or flank match hawk and flank possessions capsule lock from the workshop of the East and the West. There's also an extensive collection of shields and helmets, with majority of helmets made of copper and fully decorated with engraved scenes. Among the shields, a rare collection includes 17th century Iranian shield, made from steel surface decorated with gold floral and geometric ornaments. So I'm waiting for tram number one and operate every 12 minutes and where are we gonna go? Well you'll find out about it soon. That's as soon as the tram shows up. Soon. With that being said, let's hope we get in and get warm. Ukraine is home to many historical and grand palaces. Lev is no exception. The most noble is the Potosky Palace. It's super luxurious. Since 2000, the resin was transferred to Lev Art Gallery, where you can see an interesting exhibition on the second floor of the palace. Today, the palace is home to a collection of European arts of 14th to the 18th century. The second floor is actually open to the public and it costs 30 us to come in here. Security is a little bit tight. Uh, you have to leave your belongings all downstairs uh, at the coat check. But uh, since we already got that done over with, let's go and check out what this palace has to offer.
In the middle of 19th century, a park with a small hunting home shed owned by the noble Polish Potoski family was located on the current site of the palace. A legend states that Potoski family owned these lands since the 17th century. In 1861, the old manor house was dismantled and began the first stage of preparation for the future construction of the palace. Now Potoski's palace was built in 1880 as an urban seat for the Minister Presence of Austria, Alfred Potoski. Now as you can see, no cost was spared to build the greatest nobleman's residence in this city. At the start of the 20th century, the park plan gave way to a network of apartment buildings. It was confiscated by the Ukrainian Soviet authority in 1940. The palace itself was adapted for holding wedding ceremony for a period of time, and subsequently underwent restoration. Palace's interior is as exquisite as was its exterior. It was designed in the style of French King Louis XVI. The ground floor was occupied by several gala halls, each of them which was individually designed and named. The red or the dancing hall, the blue hall, and the mirror hall. All of them are decorated with a seco work, gilt, and colored marbles. And uh, as you can see, it's pretty grand. Finally, I get to see myself. And uh, it's pretty crazy how this how big it is. A short ride away, we the visit the Sassai Lonsky Prison National Memorial Museum. This is a free museum and also a former detention center in Lev. Now, throughout the 20th century, this museum is primarily used to hold local prisoners from Poland, Soviet, and Nazi regimes. And today, it's been turned into National Museum Memorial for Occupation Regimes. The building complex was built in 1889-1890, built in the Neo-Renaissance style and originally designed for Austro-Hungarian gendarmerie's main office in the city. The portion where the prison is actually located was built soon after World War I in 1918-1920 when Lev was part of the Second Polish Republic. This prison was used by the occupying power as a tool to suppress the aspiration of the Ukrainian people to create their own independent state. This is where the political prisoners are interrogated and tortured. During the period of 1918 to 1939, in the Polish occupation, it was unofficially used for political prisoners from the anti-government organizations. With the start of World War II in 1939, the prison was transformed into Prison No. 1, which is designed to accommodate 1,500 prisoners. During the Nazi invasion of Soviet Union in June 1941, there were over 1,000 prisoners shot in this ground. During 1941 to 1944, the building was used as Gestapo detention center and one of the high profile prisoners was a former Prime Minister of Poland, Kazimierz Bartel, between July 21st to 26, 1941. A short trip on the tram will lead you to the Ukraine's most famous cemetery, officially the State History and Cultural Museum Preserve, or Lenchik Cemetery. 
Now this is the most famous cemetery here in Ukraine. It was built in 1787. And initially it was meant for middle and upper class and intellect. And it's where also some of the most famous and prominent Ukrainians final resting place. In the mid-1850s, the cemetery was expanded with a present network of alleys and roundabouts. Then, it became the city's main cemetery and soon most other cemeteries were closed. After World War II, the city was annexed by the Soviet Union to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic and seen a period of devastation of the historical monument located at the cemetery. Up to 1971, many of the sculptures were destroyed. However, in 1975, the cemetery was declared a historical monument and the desecration ended. Since the 1980s, the cemetery has seen constantly rebuilding and refurbishment and continued to be one of the principal tourist attractions. So I want to know about the trams here. Uh, forget what the Google map tells you, it's on my map. It says every four minutes you get one of those trams. But I've been waiting for more than 10 minutes. So traveling in Ukraine, you do need a little bit of patience and enjoy the unpredictability because it can be an adventure. Oh, by the way, uh, if you don't have a silly live card, uh, this is how you pay your dues. And don't forget to validate your tickets. You get, you put it in here. You. All right. So it's really hard to do it with one hand, but here it goes. Done. Oh yes, after a long day of walking and seeing, walking and seeing, you got the idea. I am freaking hungry and I demand a nice meal. But let's try something different tonight. So you can see that is means dumplings. And Jinjiang means golden dumplings. So this is what you have over here. This is beef. And see how it stack up to the real stuff I have at home. Well that being said, let's just eat. Ukrainian Chinese dumplings. Okay. Dip it in. I don't think it's Asian, but I think they try. It's a little bit weird because there's no vegetables inside there. Real dumplings come with vegetables. With no luck in finding a great dumpling or a Ukrainian wife for that matter, uh, how about at least a falafel? A good falafel. Oh, uh, what's next? <laughs> falafel. Stop. Over here on your train. <laughs> One of them fell down. So it's okay, no worries. Inside here is pretty correct. Some of there need to be some tahini sauce. But oh, this is Ukrainian sauce. It's very, very hard to get ingredients, authentic ingredients in here. I think that's why, but I think they do their best to make it authentic as possible. With well, being a little bit more hopeful, I continue my bench eating adventure. So as an Asian and who travel a lot and get to go to so many places in Asia, my standard for Asian food is very high. So I just wanted to actually give it a shot and compare how their Thai food stack up to the real Thai food I eat at home and the one I ate in Thailand. Okay, so what's in here is actually tofu. And uh, this is wheat rice. The portion is a bit small actually for 72 Ukrainians. But at the same time, I already ate them, so I don't really care. I don't need to gain more weight. So let's eat. The noodles are actually a little bit hard and a little bit too salty. Let's try tofu. 
I tell you what, the tofu is not that fresh, so it's actually, uh, I would say avoid tofu. Maybe go with chicken, or beef, or pork, or something like that. But, you know, this is Ukraine. Um, they, they, it might be hard to get all the ingredients, so I'm very, very forgiving. One more time. I'm gonna go back to eating my food. I would give this 2.5 out of 5. Sorry guys, I wish I could give you a better grade. I also want to sweeten up my night. I heard there's a lot of fancy places where I can grab some sweet, sweet chocolate justice. So I'm such a chocolate fanatic. So when I saw this chocolate shop, I had to come in here. It's right by the square and what I ordered is this right here. Um, mixed ch uh, melted chocolate. I think there's like dark chocolate, melt chocolate, and also white chocolate. So with that being said, all right, you ready? Mmm. Oh my god. I can eat this all day. Seriously, I can eat this all day. They actually also give you a cup of water. And now I know why. Because it's actually really, really, really sweet. One thing that's really good about it is the texture. It's very creamy. In a sense, it's like very smooth. And trust me, I have really high standard for chocolates. But I am not done yet. I'm so optimistic that I'm going to pick up some specialty chocolate for my future mail order bride. Uh, wish me luck, guys. I've never seen so many kind of chocolate in my life. It's actually crazy. It's like, oh my god, they have rum chocolate. They have different nuts. It's mint cheerful flights. Oh, they don't come cheap, but they look absolutely delicious. <laughs> That is how I ended my trip here in Ukraine. <coughs> Just joking. Uh, the search for the mail order bribe continued with a trip back to the bar. I mean, uh, railway station. If you come here early, you can come and enjoy the lounge right here. It's very, very comfortable. Lots of seating. You can grab some drinks. Pretty reasonable price. You can get like a sandwich for one dollar. Uh, so it's actually not bad. With that being said, let's hope the clock passes quicker. I'm looking forward to a good night of sleep on the train because I got premium class tonight. So once again, I'm boarding a Ukrainian train this time. It's going to be on premium class. Two bed in one cabin and I occupy one of them. Hopefully there won't be anyone else in it. With that being said, I hope the journey to Odessa will be smooth and fast. Not so fast. <laughs> Here's why. Okay, so this is a really screw up situation. I'm back in the lounge here. Unfortunately, the ticket they gave me was the wrong direction. I so I was forced off the train, um, and I had to get another ticket. So, but thank goodness there's another train available to Odessa. So I'm hopping on to 11:30 train and arriving 11:30 tomorrow. Um, I really hope this will be a safe and fast ride. I really don't want any more surprises. So finally after overnight train, I'm arriving on this side. You can see that's a train station right there. Uh, despite the ordeal, I'm still very happy that I'm here. With that being said, my hotel is roughly only about 600 meters away from here. It's a nice 10 minutes walk. <laughs> Let's get going. I also like to thank my accommodation sponsor, Friday Hostel, located just a few minutes away from the railway station. They offer both dorm beds and private rooms in case you got better luck in finding that Ukrainian bride. All in a fun and youthful atmosphere with video games, full kitchen, and a super, super clean bathrooms. Not to forget, friendly staff. Thanks, guys.
Odessa is the third most populous city in Ukraine, a major tourist center, seaport, and transport hub located in the northwestern shore of the Black Sea. The city was the site of a large Greek settlement no later than the middle of the 6th century BC and named after the ancient Greek city of Odessa, which is mistakenly believed to have been located there. Historically, the city is a multi-ethnic cultural center. Odessa is sometimes referred to as the Pearl of the Black Sea or as South Capital under the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Today, Odessa is a home to a population of 1.1 million with its economy largely starting from the traditional role as a port city. Some even call it a city of broad, given abundance of beautiful women and shortage of quality men. Since this is my last stop, you really have to wish me luck. Big time. Once again, I was early and need to fill up for the day. It means the permission to eat, eat, and eat more. Uh, yes, it's breakfast time. So walking down, I smell mm, the big fresh pastries. And I decided to come right in here and, uh, and, um, and grab some inexpensive pastries. I'm going to show you what they got. It's, uh, it's price is reasonably priced. I'm for about 50 cents to get like a thick ass chocolate cinnamon roll. But that being said, I also ordered an Americano, but I'm not going to wait. So let's eat. Oh my god, look at that. That is epic. That's chocolate on chocolate. I better not keep eating this or else I'll end up with diabetes. I think it's time to start our day and uh, with that being said, head down to the city square. Alright, you ready? So, let's get going. First up, Odessa's Archaeological Museum. Once again, it's one of the oldest archaeological museums in Ukraine. Yes, it was founded in 1825 and the current museum building was completed in 1883. Uh, before you get museum fatigue, I promise you this is the last museum with a visit. I promise. The museum has a collection size of more than 160,000 artifacts, including archaeological finds from the Northern Black Sea region. It also has the largest collection in Ukraine of ancient Egyptian sarcophagi, stone steps or hieroglyphics, and fragments of papyrus, as well as ancient Greek and ancient Roman exhibits. Right across is the Odessa Opera and Ballet Theater, opened in 1810 and destroyed by fire in 1873. The construction for the modern neo baroque style building began in 1884 and opened in 1887. The theater was the first building in Odessa to employ Edison Company with electric illumination. Here's a fun fact and an interesting scam. In 1831, Michael von Lovatso, the Governor General of the Russian Empire, decided to assign an old instituted coin fee to the Odessa Theater. The historian Charles King explains that one of the military inspectors in Odessa was the owner of the Odessa Theater. When the ticket sales were low, he would announce the discovery of a new infection among the newly arrived passengers and order them to be quarantined at their own cars. The expense of Lazarado where the passenger that stay will be used to hire major performance for the theater. What a in <laughs> ingenious business idea. In 1925, the building was burnt in a fire. There was a story that when the Odessa people learned the construction cost 1.3 million gold rubles, they gasped. Whew. But when they saw the new theater, they gasped again. This time in admiration.
Another major landmark in the Simbala Dansa is Pritankin Stairs, originally known as Boulevard Steps or Giant Staircase or Redio Steps. Well, this is Pomiskan Stairs. It's considered the formal entrance from the sea to the city and it's also the most recognizable landmark here in Odessa. The original 200 stairs was designed in 1825 by an Italian and two St. Petersburg architects. The staircase cost over 800,000 rubles to build. In 1837, the decision was made to build a monstrous staircase, which was constructed between 1837 and 1841. As the erosion destroyed the stairs, in 1933, a stone was replaced by a rose gray granite from the bowl area, and the landing was covered with asphalt. Eight steps was lost under the sand when the poor house was extended, reducing the number of stairs to 192, with 10 landings. In 1955, during the Soviet era, the Porosky Scares were renamed the Potankin Scares to honor the 50th anniversary of the mutiny on the battleship Potankin. At the top of the stairs is a monument in the honor of Duke de Rilut, depicting the former governor of Odessa town. The Roman Tonga figure was designed by the Russian sculptor Ivan Pervovich Martos. <laughs> Another interesting site is located at the beginning of Zuzovsky Boulevard, the Monument to the Orange, or <laughs> as a resident of Odessa called it, the Monument to the Bribe, and not without a reason. <laughs> The Catherine II was considered the mother of Odessa and passed away in 1796. Her zealous son was determined to undo all the achievements of Catherine, in particular, the construction of a new city and a port on the Black Sea. The legend tells the clever Odessans have decided to woo Paul. They decided to appease his taste by expediting the opening of spring navigation in order to allow quick arrival of fruit. The Odessan citizen chose 3,000 of the best variety of oranges and arranged them by magistrate to send their gift to the emperor. Plan worked brilliantly. Paul relented and agreed the allocation of 250,000 rubles for the development of the port. The city was saved. Now, if you're hungry, I got you covered with some great variety of delicious food at the Odessa Food Market. Now, one of the best places you can come and check out if you are into food is this food in Cornea. And there's actually two floors, and uh, there's all kind of things you can check out. Uh, with that being said, let's go and check out what they have to offer. Well, this place is not cheap, but you can get absolutely everything here. It spans two floors. It's definitely not a great place to lose weight. <laughs> So there's no surprise there's a seafood market here in Odessa. I mean it is surrounded by sea and uh, what's so surprising is they have it inside a uh, market like this. So if you like local beers, there's one right behind me. I have not seen the name of this particular beer before so hopefully it's local local. But I miss Chinese food. I hope it's cheap. After all, <laughs> I am on a budget. I finally found uh, a Chinese restaurant here in Odessa. As you know, my Chinese food standard is really high. I am Chinese. So with that being said, what I ordered was fried noodles with chicken, as well as hot and sour soup. So I'm going to see how good is your Chinese food stack up to ours. 
Now this just came up. This is actually uh, Chinese. Uh, this is uh, fried noodles. <laughs> and with chickens. I don't know where the heck is the chicken, but I guess these tiny pieces are chicken. Um, so, with that being said, this is the Ukrainian Chinese food. Let's eat. There's not enough meat and it needs more soy sauce. Um, just put some little more salt here. Maybe this will make it better, uh, less um, dull. No, it needs more soy sauce. I'm gonna ask for more soy sauce. I cannot say you shouldn't come and try it. So I'm pretty neutral. It's a very new experience. So let's continue eating. It's not um, up to par to be polite, but if you want to try out something cheap and local, the local market, Odessa's famous Perez market, is the way to go. So this is one of the biggest markets here in Ukraine, and I go nuts just by looking at all the nuts I can sample because I love nuts. But over here, you can find everything from fruits to uh, meat to uh, clothing and everything else. This is where local people come and uh, shop and it's an off beaten path and it's a great chance for you to see how the local people live. Um, with that being said, I'm really excited to see what else the market has to offer. So let's go and check it out. This is not just a great place to get free samples of nuts that will fill you up or experience the fresh smell of rare spices to spice up your life. Uh, but also a great place to polish up your fashion. Uh, grab some shoes uh, all at a great price. But don't forget to bargain and bargain hard. <laughs> So unless you're coming here to buy shoes, I recommend you come early in the morning for everything else. Uh, that's when all the produce vendors and fruit vendors and everyone else bring in all their fresh goods and where you can get all the fresh pigs. Now this market is just really, really, really big and they have different sections, for example, clothing, shoes, and uh, so this section right here is fabric. Now, no matter what section you go to, there's one thing you can always find nearby, food. And I've got this big pasta cake for only uh, 50 cents. Did I mention you may want to pick up some flour for your male or the bride? I heard Ukrainian women loves flowers, but I'm here for one reason, to eat. <laughs> I mean, to eat local and cheap. Now, as you can already tell, there's many, many places you can eat within the market, and there's even restaurants, and I come to an authentic Ukrainian restaurant, and this is what I'm going to have for my breakfast. A soup and a hot It doesn't get as local as this um, and this is where all the local Ukrainian come and eat I don't know what he's eating but it looks really really good and as you can see they are making fresh pastries and then more local people eating so with that being said let's eat it's um tomato soup with some anchovies and this is what they how they eat actually now this is gonna be really filling thing is I'm going to have traditional Ukrainian chicken <laughs> fried with um, I believe is egg batter so let's eat I'm correct it's fried with egg batter and this I believe is mashed potato their mashed potatoes is really epic I bet they don't really use butter I also make sure I think you have to use some level of um, salt. Mm. Well, that being said, I'm going to go back to eating. Bon appetit, people.
<laughs> After this much food, it's time to get some more exercise and burn mm. off some fuel in the but most today, interesting way. But here's the deal. Bring a flashlight and a comfortable shoes and meet me at Odessa's local bus station. And our ride takes about 20 minutes. Odessa is said to have two parts. One is the public one for everyone, which is above the ground. And the other part is the mysterious underground town. An enormous network of man-made caves, also known as the catacombs. Unlike other caves, all the tunnels were carved by people. The network total explored length is about 2,800 kilometers. <laughs> oh yes. Because of its size, it's easy to get lost. Therefore, I strongly recommend you take an inexpensive group tour. Um, that's another reason I am not reviewing the exact location. If you really want to do a solo, consider going to the official museum of Parson Glory in Nudobeski. You have always have to mind your head. Oh, hair though. Oh, <laughs> watch out for the low ceilings and don't bang up your head. Secondly, follow your guide. By the way, this is our amazing local guide. Listen to your guide, please, honestly. After all, the catacomb consists of a network of basements, bunkers, drainage tunnels, storm drains, as well as natural cave with 1,000 known entrance to the tunnel. Not the easiest to navigate, and not the safest place to be either. Uh, some sections are regularly flooded with groundwaters. Others have ceilings that precariously pop up with a hot support beams. The hand in the woody gates. And in the night, some old worker or engineer must look in the middle the, of the century. That's when, yeah. I first, uh, when the first mine opened, right? Yes, uh, to tell the truth, it is the oldest date that we find in this system, in this village. Uh, it's a very special underground mineral. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see it in the caves 1912, 1913, 1914. Last year, before the beginning of First World War. The reason is, uh, it was a period of very fast economical growth of Russian Empire and Odessa was being enlarged very fast mm -hmm. in this period. Of course, the builders need uh, a lot of stones. In the 19th century, most houses in Odessa were built of limestones that was mined here as a source of cheap construction material. These mines were abandoned after the Russian Revolution of 1917, and later, stone mining were banned altogether. Later, these mines were used and widened by local smugglers, creating a series of underground tunnels beneath Odessa. In 1961, the Search Club was created in order to explore the history of partisan movement among the catacombs. Since its creation, it has expanded the understanding of catacombs and provided information to mapping of the tunnels. It is thought that most of the catacombs are formed of coquina multi-level mines from which the stones are extracted to construct the cities above. The remaining catacombs 3 to 5 percent are either natural cavities or were extracted for other purposes such as sewage. Five years ago, the village administration created a water pipe mm -hmm. in this village. Five years ago, the village administration created a water pipe. How many years do you think? Uh, it's uh, maybe about 80, 90, 100 years. Oh my so, god! Yes. Wow. Yes, During the World War II, the Calicum was served as a hiding place for the Soviet loyalists, in particular the squad of Vladimir Monosov, and the Soviet freedom fighter used it as their safe haven to hide from the Nazis and to conduct guerrilla warfare. People who sleep in the catacombs in the past, they have no sleeping bags and they try to cover the stone beds with a layer of straw or cane mm -hmm. to make it warmer. Slava is a KPSS and a Nikita Khrushchev. It's um, like a long leaf of glorified B, Central Committee of Communist Party of Soviet Union, huh. and its leader Nikita Khrushchev. It was very important inscription. Hurra, 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 long live for the Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece and Montenegro. Let's tell about this cross. Uh, this cross, yes. Yes, um, to tell the truth, it's, um, I'm boring of this cross because it's too popular place, mm -hmm. maybe the first. So you were smoking and they yes. were making it? Yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> 
My guy also told me that he witnessed some teens making this cross, so contrary to the legends, there's nothing historical about it. With our tour being done, we took the bus back to Odessa and it's time to go home and pack up and say goodbye to this fascinating country. Oh no, no, hell no. Uh, I still haven't gotten my dose of Ukrainian street meat. I mean, uh, street food. Now, one of the surprising uh, street food here is actually strong. It's actually very inexpensive. It costs about 50, which is roughly about $1.75. Uh, so let's give her a shit. <laughs> Sorry, let's give her a... I'm so cold, I can't even say. So, let's eat! That's a real shawarma. It's good. The only thing is they put potato in there, which I'm not used to. They also put sour cream, which is very traditional for Ukrainian. Bon appétit, piva. With that being done, it's time to say goodbye to Ukraine for real. Odessa International Airport and Railway offers connection to major cities across Europe. But for me, I will be heading over to Prez bus terminal to take a 3 hour bus to Kashinu in Moldova. And this is my magnificent journey of Ukraine. As for getting that mail order bribe, uh, maybe I have better luck next time. So I'll be back. Ukraine is a beautiful country with a diverse culture, long and colorful history, and a nation of proud and strong people. Although in the recent years it has faced countless challenges, the spirit of this nation would never be conquered. Since its independence, it has developed itself into a democracy. It is one of the few countries with a space industry, a strong participation in the area of sport producing countless soccer stars and Olympic medals, as well as progress in the area of culture, including winning the Eurovision and Film Awards in Cannes. Its commitment to the world peace are often overlooked, as Ukraine become the world's first country to voluntarily give out its nuclear weapons inherited from the Soviet Union. Ukraine, like its historical cathedrals, and continue to stand tall. Its monuments continue to shine, a nation of progress and transition. I invite you to visit this magnificent country, experience its warm hospitality of its amazing people. Most importantly, feel its soul and spirit at the heartbeat of Europe.